and welcome to Jahan classes for a clear so today i will explain class 10th history chapter 2 and our chapter is nationalism in india so nationalism in india now in the last chapter we had discussed about the nationalism in europe we had seen that how the ideas of nationalism had arisen in europe and we have seen that because through the, the nationalism people got to know who they were their identity and the country the nation they belonged to now you have seen that because of the nationalism ideas there were many nation states that were created we had discussed about germany and italy so you could say that, that was all about here but what about india now we had seen about new songs new symbols and new ideas that were being created for the unity for a sense of unity among the communities but what about india what about the nationalism in our country now you know what that during that time india was a colony of britishers and like all the colonies uh, we are like minded you could say now in india also like all other colonies people wanted freedom from independence from the colonizers from the britishers you could say now all people's main goal was to be free to get independence to occupy independence from the colonizers from the britishers you could say and that's why there was sense of unity among the people you could say that their main goal was same but their ways were different now all people were seeing their own problems that were given by the britishers and that's why they were not fighting each other together they were not fighting towards the britishers together and that's why you could say that there was a need to, to to unite them together to unite the people of india together and that was done by mahatma gandhi so how was it done we will see in this chapter now in this chapter we will discuss about civil disobedience movement about the march salt and also we will discuss about the non cooperation movement so what were those movements how the things turned out we will discuss in this chapter now you know, if you remember that in the class 8th history we had also discussed us about the national movements and in that chapter we have seen about these movements but in this chapter we will see about the broader perspective of those movements so all this is going to be in this chapter so without a further ado let's start our chapter with our first topic that is the first world war khilafat and non cooperation so the first world war khilafat and the non cooperation now you know that for impact now there was a very great impact of world war first world war in india as well as i often know that the first world war that was started in 1914 to 1918 to so the time period of 1918 to 1919 you could say so that was about the first world war but that had an impact in india as well you might have been thinking that it was Peter fought that it was fought by the Britishers, Russians, by the Europeans. So what did we have to do? But we did have a connection with that First World War. Now the First World War, what was happening was that that many people were forcibly recruited as the services for the army services for the British army from our country. So from many villages and towns, many youth of India, many young people of India were forcibly recruited as the services, as the servants of the army. to say our britishers to fight the first world war now it was against their choice but they were tortured or they were forced you could say now what was happening that they were not afraid to die you could say but it was a fight it was a war against russians france europeans so we didn't have anything to do but because we are the colony of britishers and that's why we did have a very big connection very great big loss in our country now many people have sacrificed themselves in the first world war and you know what that in the first world war the british army also needed money the financial support for the equipments for the service in the army and that's why so much tax was introduced was increased in our country that was loading burden that was loading pressure on the people of our country on the common people of our country and that outraged them now what was happening was that you could say that during that time many people many those who were common people the middle class people were not able to afford so many things now the prices of commodities were almost increased to double almost double you could say now the to, if we compare the prices of commodities from time period of 1918 to 1919 and the 1920 to 1921 then the prices of commodities were doubled and that increased the pressure more and more pressure among the common people because they had to pay taxes 
that much and they had the prices of goods were also increased that much and that a, a, a common people in our country could not afford it and that's why there was more and more hectic situation in our country due to the first world war and it was not just due to the first world war but even after the first world war it did have an impact in our country now what happened during the first world war that many people recruited from the villages so much financial support and that was not uh, you could say that, that was out of the control of the people of india and that's why they didn't want it anymore now they were outraging because of it and they were uprising as well so you could say that, that was the impact of first world war in india and during the same time what happened that there was an epidemic that was introduced in india that had come into india that was influenza epidemic and that also caused a lot of death in our country and there were less production of food crops as well because they were not given sufficient food there were less farmers there were death of farmers as well and there was less lands you could say the less cultivated lands and that's why there was less loss of production of food crops as well low pro productivity of food crops of agriculture and that led to the death of 12 to 13 million people 13 million Indians you could say during the time period of first world war during the time period of 1990 to 1920 and that caused a very outrage among the people so what was the role of Mahatma Gandhi in it let's discuss about him with our subtopic that is the idea of Satyagraha so the idea of Satyagraha now you know what in Mahatma Gandhi that had come into India in 1915 now before that he was studying he was practicing of his lawyer of his barrister occupation in South Africa and even in South Africa already he had done movement against the race regime and from there there was an idea that was introduced to the people to the people of India that was the idea of Satyagraha now in Satyagraha there are two words that are Satya plus Agraha now Satya means here truth is Hindi and Agra means to force an emphasis, to force an emphasis on something. So the idea of Satya was basically that, this basic meaning was that, that it meant that you have to see, you have to reflect the truth by the use of non-violence. We don't have to use violence to the oppressor for, from, the, from the side that were being oppressed to see the truth, to reflect the truth because it would be the forcing to, uh, to accept the truth but we have to realize the truth to the oppressors and and that's why there was a very great method of Mahatma Gandhi that was of non-violence due to the Satyagrahas. So you could say that from the idea of South Africa because already in South Africa he had went, he had practiced there and he had seen the situation there of race regime. Now you know more that in South Africa there was race discrimination among the people. Now between blacks and whites there was a lot of difference and we had already seen it in the last class of civics. Now you have seen that that there was a lot of indiscrimination among the use of among the for the use of public things public wells tanks office and all those things public buildings and all those things so you could say that there was a very great discrimination in south africa into the blacks and whites and even the whites and colorful people so you could say that white were dominant in that society and Muhammad Gandhi had also been in that discrimination and that's why he raised his voice against that races race discrimination regime and from there the idea of Satyagraha was given to the people who had come into the minds of people and that was uh, you know that when he had experimented that idea of Satyagraha in South Africa when Mahatma Gandhi came into India he also thought of experimenting those ideas of Satyagraha in India as well and that's why many small movements in states were being done were being led by Mahatma Gandhi like in 1970 the first movement was of Champaran Andolan or Champaran movement in this district of Bihar. Now, uh, after that, then in the same year, in 1917, in the Kera region of Gujarat, it was also led by Mahatma Gandhi. And after that, in 19, around the year of 1980, and around the year of 1918, there was a movement that was led by Mahatma Gandhi that was in the Ahmedabad district of our country. So you could say that those were the movements that were led by the Mahatma Gandhi. And those were a kind of experiments for the Satyagraha's ideas in our country. So those were different movements for different regions like for the among the workers and against the landlords and for the tax 
taxes because in Kerala region there was you know that people were not able to to pay the taxes because of the drought and floods and that's why they got a help from Mahatma Gandhi and that's why that movement was started so you could say that those different movements those different experiments of Mahatma Gandhi were successful and that's why he was thinking of a big movement now and that is about the ideas of Satyagraha now you have seen that those ideas of Satyagraha were had come from the mind of Mahatma Gandhi and those were being experimented you could say that those were being tried in India and now the main focus of Mahatma Gandhi was to unite people because without unity there won't be any strength as all of you know that this famous proverb that is strength lies in unity so you could say that that has to be done in India as well and how is it so let's discuss with our next topic that is the Rawlitz Act so the Rawlitz Act now we have seen that Mahatma Gandhi had success in his local experiments about the Satyagraha movements and now he was emboldened with the success of those Satyagrahas and that's why he he started he thought of starting a Satyagraha against the proposal of Rawlitz Act now this Rawlitz Act that was introduced in 1990 now he started a Satyagraha against it now this Satyagraha was started and after that you know that on it was started basically on 6 8 April 1990 because this Rawlitz Act according to this act what was happening that what was inside this row, rule rule you could say was basically that that all those leaders all those political leaders could be present up without any trial for two years and all those political leaders you know the government was given enormous power despite the opposition of India leaders so you could say that that was against the pride of India and any person could be taken away or could be imprisoned for two years without any trial so that was unjustice unfair and that's why this Satyagraha this Rawlitz Satyagraha was started was you could say that basically declared off was basically declared on on 6 April 1919 with a hartal hartal means a kind of strike that was non-violent so you could say that that was non-violent not violent because as all of you know that in the point in the opinion of Mahatma Gandhi Satyagraha Satyagraha have to have to be non-violent you could say and that's why all those banks public buildings the schools colleges all those were shut down all those shops had collapsed down and there was no thing there was no activity that was going on in the markets of those area in the markets of Punjab in the northern India and that's why Britishers were scaring who have was afraid that there would be a disruption there would be disruptions in the communication there was we were there would be a very big disruption service in the communications through telegraph or railway lines and that's why they decided to clamp down all those political leaders all those movement leaders and that's why local leaders that were leading the movements were now imprisoned and many people were taken off many satyagrahis were taken off were imprisoned from the areas of Amritsar and also Mahatma Gandhi was also barred to enter the area of Delhi that was our Nikusadet capital that is present on the capital of India but not during that time so it was banned from entering the region of Delhi and all those local movements all those local movements were shut down because of the brutal activity because of the brutal operation repression from the Britishers and after that what happened in the Amritsar in the Amritsar region of Punjab the condition was going worst now many police officers were beating the uh, you know the Satyagrahis and many leaders many leaders and many those who had participated in the movements were also attacking back and that's why there was havoc in that region and that's why martial law was imposed in that region and you know that all commands were took were all commands were given to general dyer now general dyer had taken the command of that region of punjab region and martial law was imposed in the punjab state of our country now after that what happened that you know that on, on 13th April 1919 the infamous Jallianabad massacre had taken place that incident took place on 13th April of 1919 now on that, on that date what happened that many people had gathered in the area of Jallianabad that was an enclosed park now after that many people were because of the government issues they were uh, they were had come there they had gone there for the meetings for this Rolex 
Kagra and many people were there for the annual Besaki Fair. And at that time, during the same time, General Dyer also entered that park and closed all the exits, blocked all the exits and just fired. Just ordered the all other army people to fire, to shoot the fire and all people in that park were killed. Now thousands of people were killed in that infamous incident. So you could say that the most infamous incident of our country is to be seen in the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. And that was done on 13th April 1919 by General Dyer, by the command of General Dyer. And that outraged the people of North India. Now in many regions in the Northern India, people were attacking the police stations, the army people were now uh, attacking the public buildings that were under the control of Britishers. And there was a very violent situation that was created. Havoc situation that was created in the northern part of our country, in the northern India. And that's why this Royalist Satyagraha was declared off, was called off by Mahatma Gandhi. Because he not thought that because that movement had led to the, uh, you could say that very uh, volatile manner. And that's why he called off that movement uh, in 1919. And after that, that movement was shut down, you could say the Satyagraha was shut down and that was about the Royal Satyagraha. <laughs> Now this Rollet Act also played an important role for this Satyagraha because if it wasn't for this uh, uh, act and if, if there wasn't this act then there wouldn't be any kind of Satyagraha movement that would be uprising and there wouldn't be any kind of this kind of infamous incident of Jalayala Bagh. So that is um, the Rollet Act of 1919 but Mahatma Gandhi didn't stop here. Now his main focus was about to you could say that was about to unite all the people of our country. Now he had seen that in that there were people from rich families and middle class families, the common people, but there weren't the low class people, though you could say that that were considered as the third quality people, the third class people, or those people who were workers, or you could say that uh, not that much middle class, not common people of our country. So you could say that those people had to be included in that movement as well, and that's why Mahatma Gandhi now thought that they had to be trained more and more. Now he thought that he had to bring all all the people, all the people from our country, from rich to the poor people of our country. And for doing so, the most important thing for the unity in our country was the unitation. Here for was the unity from between Hindu and Muslims. Now you know that between these two religions during that time there were too much conflicts. So that's why the main purpose was of Mahatma Gandhi was about the unite these two groups that were Muslims and Hindus. And during that time, one such issue, one such famous issue was of Khilafat. Now you know that what happened that during the first world war the Ottoman Empire of Turkey was defeated by the British Army by the alliances and that's why the Emperor of Ottoman Empire, the Emperor of Turkey that was considered as Khalifa, the Islamic God of all the Muslims. Now he had been imposed a very, there was a very harsh treaty that was imposed on him and that outraged the Muslim people, the Muslim community of our countries and that's why they were also ready to be united with Hindus. So you could see that this Khilafat issue brought together Hindus and Muslim communities. Now what happened basically actually here was that in the year of 1919, now in the year of 1919, there was a club, there was a committee that was formed that was known as the Khilafat Committee. And in that committee, there were two, you know that, you know that there were two youth brothers that were Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali. Now they started this committee because of the Khilafat issue and also was preparing to be brought under the United with Hindus. Now they talked with Bahatma Gadi and Bahatma Gadi saw this opportunity with a very good opportunity and thus he brought all people under the same umbrella so you could say that that was all happened and now he was preparing for a non-cooperation movement that was he would not cooperate with the Britishers so you could say that in the year of 1920 this movement was being started now all those people were looking for the popular support now you know that uh, there was a Congress party that was under you know that Mahatma Gandhi was not in that party but it was given the uh, guide by Mahatma Gandhi 
in that party there were many famous leaders aware big leaders and famous leaders of our country like motilal nehru cr das and many more big leaders of our country that had led the way to the independence of our country so you could say that that party that was a congress the indian national congress and mahatma gandhi were now all you know that there was a congress session at calcutta in 1920 and in that calcutta session of 1920 the the, the, the you could say that the starting of non cooperation movement was declared and that was for also the swaraj for our country for the independence of our country so for the non cooperation movement the thought was you know that the the talking of people the decision of non cooperation movement was taken in the calcutta session of 1920 and after that it was thinking the people the leaders were looking for the popular support so how did the things go in the non cooperation movement how did the things go in that movement let's discuss about them with our next up topic that is why non cooperation so why non cooperation now you know not why do we need non cooperation why not other methods now that answer this answer of this question has been given in the book that is written by mahatma gandhi that is hind swaraj that was written in 1909 now in this book he has written that we don't have to we don't have to cooperate with the british it is because we accept their ideas their new ideas their new symbols it is because we cooperate with britishers that's why we are still uh, you know that depended on the britishers so that was his idea to gain independence from the britishers the first thing we need to have is non cooperation no cooperation with britishers now his basic idea here was that that he didn't want the goods the foreign goods the civil services that was provided by the colonizers by the britishers the civil services the protection the army the police services and of course the all the foreign goods for education for an all clothes jewelry and all those things and that did it have to be we don't have to cooperate with them in that matter and that is the concept of non cooperation movement but during the time you know that in september in the calcutta session of 1920 there was a decision of non cooperation movement when after that in the months of around october and september there was a little bit hesitation among the political leaders of congress party now they were thinking, Taking the chance, the opportunity to run the election, to stand in the election that was provided by the Britishers according to the Government of India Act. So they were a little bit hesitating about leaving those opportunities for standing in the election because during that time, in the standing in the election meant very big thing. So you could say that for a standing election to gain support from the people, they were a little bit hesitating. But finally, in November, in Nagpur session of Congress in Nagpur. it was completely declared the national the non cooperation movement and that was to not to cooperate with any britishers to call off all those things <laughs> Now you could say that all those people are from the Khilafat Committee that was the Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali and all those big leaders that were Motilal Nehru and C R Das and many more big leaders Nana Sahib and uh, Mahatma Gandhi of course they were looking for the popular support the lowest the poorest people of our country to bring together to against all those Britishers and that's why many students gave up their studies gave up their schools that was uh, the declaring that they starting off non cooperation movement so what do, how does it, how did the things go on the non cooperation movement and how was it started how was it declared off let's discuss about it with our next topic what were the views of the people with our next topic that is different strands within the movement so different strands within the movement now as i have said that non cooperation and khilafat movement that was known as non cooperation khilafat movement was started in the month of january in 1921 as it was completely decided the decision was made in the november and after that in december there was so much popular support that was taken and even earlier than that there was so much popular support from the people and finally in the 19 in the year of 1921 in the month of january this non cooperation Cooperation movement was started officially, and after that, you know that all people had their own different meaning of the, this non-cooperation movement and Swaraj. Now the term was same, but the meaning was different for the different people. And how was so different? How were the things? Let's discuss about them with our subtopic that is 
the movement in the towns. So the movement in the towns. Now first we will discuss about the spread of non-cooperation movement in the towns. Now in towns or the cities, they were mostly the middle class peoples that were participating in this movement. As I will know that in middle class people, in middle class uh, community society of that during that time, they basically included people like lawyers, students and all those professionals. And now they were also participating in this non-cooperation movement and this Khilafat non non-cooperation movement and now they were boycotting all those foreign goods now they were boycotting all those foreign clothes now all those foreign clothes were burnt down in the bonfires all liquor shops were picketed and all those foreign goods were boycotted completely all students left their public schools that were governed by the government by the Britishers and also their teachers also left now so there was no one to study and no one to teach as well so all students left their school, all teachers also resigned their, pro uh, their processes, their, you know, that pro pro position in any school or college or universities that was governed by the Britishers. And after that, all those lawyers also left their, pro also left their legal practice of lawyers, of, of that occupation, because that was also provided by the Britishers. So in those ways, all those foreign items, all those foreign activities, goods, all those services were boycotted by the middle class people in this participation of non-cooperation movement and you know that all things are these activities were going on and also that affected the lives of the people as well but after that what happened was that now you know that many people were wearing khadi and that led to the uprising uprising you know that available power to those workers textile workers of indian traditional textile workers indian traditional textile workers Workers and all those handloom workers now their work was going on but after that after some months after some days what happened was that the situation was absolutely not right in this in these towns now as all of you know in compared to the foreign clothes the khadi was too very expensive too much very expensive and that's why now people were preferring more and for foreign clothes because those were made from the machines and these khadi goods and these khadi Khazi clothes were made by the hand loom, by the hand and that's why they were very much expensive and that's why people were now uh, leaving those Khadi clothes and were now preferring more and more foreign clothes but uh, before that uh, they were just prefer preferring the Khadi clothes as you would be surprised to know that the fact that between the year 1921 to 1922 there was a decrease of uh, foreign impulse in our country to half say now, now 1921 it was around 102 crores of foreign import uh, because of that foreign business but now that businessmen were declining were defined to trade with them and that's why 1922 that fact that data had decreased to just 57 crores so you could say that from 102 crores to 57 crores that was almost half you know that more than even half so you could say that that had decreased but now people are preferring more foreign goods because they were good for them because they were cheaper and students were also joining schools now and teachers as well because all those universities colleges schools that were shut down that were controlled by the Britishers had to be had to be replaced by the institutions by the Indians that were built by the Indians that were governed by the Indians and that thing was very slowly done that was that thing was done but very slowly so it was not in the pack with the students with the number of students and with the number of teachers and that's why they were now joining those Britishers government school that were governed by the Britishers so you could see that they could not take a uh, participation in the non-cooperation movement at all and starting they did have potential they did have excitement but after that things after the, some time went they just forgot all of this because they had their own way of living their own life because they had their own opinion they had their own view so you could say now that was about the non-cooperation movement in the towns now you can actually say that in the starting it was successful but not at all because 
the lives of the middle class people were just like professionals they had to keep pace with the society they had to deliver you know then they had to live there with their dignity and so called things so that is about non cooperation movement in the towns now our next sub topic is rebellion in the countryside so the rebellion in the countryside now from towns from cities that rebellion or not just rebellion you could say it is a movement so that movement spread to the countryside now it's countryside in the villages in rural areas people had their own terms people had their own different meaning of these terms like non cooperation movement or the swaraj now in the village areas we are going to discuss about the peasants and tribal people now peasants were there suffering versus they seeing their own problems and tribals their own now let's discuss about the peasants as i hope you know that i have said that in the now you could say that most number of farmers during that time were at the region of avad now avad that was in the united provinces now today it is up or uttar pradesh so you could say that that region of avad that province of avad there were many farmers <laughs> now all those peasants were suffering from the landlords or you could say that the, you could say that they were the tenants and that's why they were asked for the begar now begar that was traditionally done in india and a very uh, you could say that very bad uh, practice that was continued in our country now begar that is uh, forcing or asking the villagers to contribute the manpower to contribute the workers without any payment so they were asked for the begar without any payment so all those peasants had to work in their fields in any construction sites or in any mines without any payments and they had to pay the rents as well without any security so there was insecurity in it in their tenor and you could say that a lot of the rents they had to pay for that little situation so and they had to pay taxes to those landlords as well so you could say that those things were very depressing them were very pressure them and that's why they wanted to get rid of them and at the same time they were you know that led by the a very a great sage during that time whose name was baba ram chandra now who was a sage or sanyasi in hindi uh, and he had also been to fedi as an indian as an indented tanner as an indented worker you could say so as a worker he had also been to fizi country and after that he returned back to india allowed the farmers or the peasants of our province and you know that before the starting of the non cooperation movement during the year of 1920 jawaharlal nehru uh, as you, you could say that you already uh, you already know who he was first prime minister for country now he had already you know that visited the area of our province and had already gained support from those peasants there he is heard about the grievances their problems and he also supported them and that's why during that time a sabha was formed that was a kisan sabha now the old kisan sabha that was formed during that time and was headed by jawaharlal nehru and by baba ram chandra and many other leaders so these types of the its branches more than 300 branches of this sabha was made in our province so you could say that that is about the support the gaining of support that was uh, gained by jawaharlal nehru to their party and that helped them in the non cooperation movement of 1921 but actually it didn't help them but because they had their own meaning now when the non cooperation movement started all those salakdars and the merchants and landlords were attacked by the peasants now their houses were burnt down and all those markets were looted down and all those grains hoarded grain storage uh, you know that warehouses where the grains were stored were also looted down by the peasants by the farmers and that didn't help mahatma gandhi at all as i often know that the basic principle of mahatma gandhi was non violence or in hindi it was ahimsa so that was his most famous slogan or most uh, you know the biggest principle of mahatma gandhi and that's fine 
it wasn't a help to the non-cooperation movement at all because those were the things that they had their own different meaning and now they were also using the name of Mahatma Gandhi all people were doing their own things with their own meanings but the name was of Mahatma Gandhi absolutely now they were saying that Mahatma Gandhi had promised them that there would be all those lands would be redistributed among the peasants and all those peasants have their own rights but they have taken that meaning that those sentences in the uh, you know that misunderstanding so that was about the movement by the peasants in the our the region in the northern part of our country for the non-cooperation movement and that was absolutely of course the use of non-violence the strict against the principle of Mahatma Gandhi that was the basic concept of non-cooperation movement because you could say that non-cooperation movement meant that we will boycott all those British things and we'll just a kind of a traumatized them but what happened actually was that people went to the streets peasants went to the streets and just uh, created a hectic situation during that time and that was about the peasants but what about the tribals now tribals they had their own different meaning of Swaraj now they were also talking about the Gandhi Raj that was the Swaraj of our country independence for our country now they had their own meaning that was of non-violence now that is the story of Gudam Hills of Andhra Pradesh of our country. Andhra Pradesh, as all of you know that, is a state of our country. Now in Andhra Pradesh, there is Gudam Hills and in those hills, there are tribal communities. Now those tribal communities took their own meaning of non Saraj term or non-cooperation term and that's why a female's uh, movement, a uh, non-violence movement, non, uh, you know that violative, not non-violative but violative movement that was started by those tribal communities was the guerrilla attack, guerrilla movement you could say. Now they were attacking to those pretty they were looting their items, they were looting their grains, jewelries, treasuries and were just hiding in the forest because uh, according to the forest rule that we had already discussed in the geographical lectures of class 8. Now we have seen that they were not allowed to enter the forest areas and that's why they thought that there were tra traditional rights, their pastures were not allowed to enter the forest, they were not allowed to pick anything from the forest as you have already seen the reserved forest. The reserved forest they were not allowed to reserve to take anything from reserved forest or their pastures were not allowed in those areas and those thought that it was the traditional right and they were just taking them Britishers were just taking them and that's why they were attacking them with a guerrilla movement with the guerrilla technique that was a very unique technique of tribal communities and after that you will surprise to know the figure who led those tribal communities now those tribal communities was led by Aluri Sitaram Raju now Aluri Sitaram Raju who uh, you know that declared himself as in uh, people thought himself people thought of himself as the incarnation of God now he said that he could heal the people and it was believed that he had a correct astrological predictions and he could not be killed even by the bullet shoots so, so that's what about him uh, you could say that that could not be possible any people would just kill would be just killed by the bullet shots so you could say that he was seen as the incarnation of the god and he said himself that he was impressed by the idea of Mahatma Gandhi of non-cooperation but he himself was a believer of violence so he was against non-violence but was with Mahatma Gandhi and that's why with the name of Mahatma Gandhi they started their guerrilla techniques and starting to started to kill and attack the those Britishers, British officials and finally in 1924 this Alori Sitaram Raju was imprisoned, was uh, you know, that arrested and after that he was executed, definitely he was executed by the Britishers. So you could say that, that is about the tribal communities, we have seen about the peasants. Now you have to see the different views of different people because they all were fighting for their own rights. Now middle class people were thinking that all people should have justice, there was not that much opinion but peasants had their own way that they should get a little bit less rent and there should be security of their tenor and after that tribals thought that they were their traditional right their human basic right was taken away by the Britishers so you have to see that that there are different views of different people and definitely different communities now our next topic our next topic is Swaraj in the plantations 
So Swaraj in the plantations that we have discussed about the tribals in the cities, towns, countryside, countryside of our country, rural urban areas. But what about the plantations? Now first of all, let's discuss about the plantations. Now in the plantations, we had already discussed that tribal communities, tribal people, according to the Inland Immigration Act of 1859, those all peasants, those all tribal communities were forced to go, to go work in the plantations as often as that they were kicked out of their forest and that's why they had to search for works and now were trapped in a vicious cycle of plantations. Now those tribal people who had come into the plantation to work were not allowed to leave, to have any leave to their families, to meet their family members only if they have the permission. Now if they have the permission that they could go but they really could have any permission by their landlords, by their contractors you could say. So that were already units and they were already against it and that's why the concept of Swaraj raised raised in the plantations but those plantation workers also were using their own methods now they thought that that non-cooperation movement had started and now it was a time for Gandhi Raj now it was the first time in Assam in Assam the plantation workers for the first time used the word term that was a Gandhi Raj and after that this Gandhi Raj term was very popular had become popular so you could say that and after that when they heard of non-cooperation movement, when they when the non-cooperation movement had started, now what they did was that they just left their work and started to run there to their homes. But in their way, they met their railway officials and the police officers who arrested them and be beat them, beaten uh, and then beat them very brutally. So you could say that they were not, uh, you know, that they used their violence and did not follow the guidelines of non-violence, and that's why they were caught by the police officers British and were uh, given very repression very big repression brutally and after that they also thought that it was a time for Gandhi Raj and when they were run to their homes they thought that they would just they didn't have any fear of anything because they just think that they just thought that, that they, when they go to their homes they were just given given land by Mahatma Gandhi so you have to see that all of those peoples had their own different perceptives perspectives and those were just different from the perspective from Mahatma Gandhi. So we have to see that the non-cooperation movement was started but there was a lot of um, more training, need of more training to the people. In lot of, in many areas of our country, non-violence was used very much at an extensive way, at an extensive extent that was just against Mahatma Gandhi. In, your, in his books and in his biography as well, you would just see that he was just against of non-violence. So you could say that that is about the non-cooperation movement the different views of different people now our next topic is towards civil disobedience so towards civil disobedience now in february 1922 mahatma Gandhi called off the non-cooperation movement addressing all those volatile methods now he saw that there was not anything that was the non-violence that he wanted and that's why he called off the non-cooperation movement in 1922 and even before then that there was a church or incident that took place and that's why it was called off completely and now he more focused focused on training the people. Now he thought that he said that he declared that we have to train more and more people. We have to train people basically to uh, you know that we have to strong, we have to strengthen our basic foundation. If the foundation is strong then only there would be mass movements that would took place and would be successful. But now after that what was happening was that, that many political leaders were now uh, you could say that were now leaving the support of Mahatma Gandhi. Now they were thinking that they should just uh, stand in the election. They do so. They should. They should just stand in elections that was given to them. That opportunity that was given to them by the Government of India Act of 1919. So according to the Government of India Act 1919, they were given just some proportion in the political system of our country. And that's why now they were uh, electing for the provincial uh, election and for the elections. So many leaders were now departed from the Congress party. Party. and many uh, you know that uh, experienced leaders like C.R. Das and uh, Motilal Nehru now are focusing now had formed their party under the Congress party that was the Swaraj party and the young leaders 
like you know that young leaders have their own opinions so young leaders like Subhash Chandra Bose and Devanand Nair were now still focusing more on mass movements and for the independence of India because unlike all those political leaders who were just gaining power were thinking that if we gain power from the elections from the political system of our country then only we can gain the independence from the Britishers but their opinion these young leaders opinion radical uh, young leader opinions was just completely as well we know that young people who have a lot of potential in them and that's why they were now focusing more and more for the independence of India through the mass movements and that was when the Great Depression came now between the period of 1926 to 1930 that was the worst situation for our country now during that time there was uh, rarely any sale of agriculture productions now they were very less harvest and those harvests were very hard to sell the prices of those commodities were falling down and they were falling so much down that there was a very uh, havoc in our country that caused a very great havoc in our country now many people were also dying and because of famines and they were also very uh, great uh, de economic depression in our countries now in peasants uh, in rural areas in countries uh, in our country what was happening that peasants were now not able to pay their taxes to pay their rents to their tenants to their landlords and they were now just uh, contributing so much bigger to those landlords for the construction construction sites mines and for any peasant work for any uh, you know that farmer work so you could see that that was a worse situation and for the and for the survey of that situation for the data basis of that situation so a simon commission was formed now simon commission that was formed under the leadership of lord simon now lord simon but the most important fact here is that there was no indian in that commission at all now in 1928 it had come to in india now there were many protesters now they were doing their movement in silence that simon go back now during that time during that day there was a most used slogan you could say that was a Simon go back and in the same incident at the station as a railway station when he came there was a movement that was led by Lala Rajput Rai he was doing that he was also quoting those quotes that was Simon go back and was beaten by the police officers so badly that he that it caused his death so you could say that you have already studied about it how the, the what caused the death of Lala Rajput Rai so you could say that because of that Simon commission came in into India for seeing those situations are country and to tell the government of India to the Britishers that what had to be changed in our country now many political leaders many people in our country were against it but what could do they do but what they could do is they could do nothing and that's why Simon Commission had come into the country and changed many things in our country that was about the 1928 after that what happened that during the same time there was a viceroy viceroy of our country that was Lord Irwin now Lord Irwin proposed a kind of dominion status offered to the Congress party and Mahatma Gandhi and according to that there was a situation there was a uh, you know that given offer he gave an offer of round table preference of now round table press of their all now what will happen for the Constitution of India he pre preferred he gave an offer of round table conference according to that where they would sit in a round table in a round manner and they would just think about the Constitution but it was not a accepted by the Congress leaders. <laughs> Now radical leaders were now more focusing, had become more and more assertive and agitative. But those liberals and moderates of Congress had lost their power, had lost their influence in the public, in the public support, because they had now standing in election and they just lost their influence. But those young leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru or Subhash Chandra Bose, who are becoming more and more assertive, and that's why you know that Mahatma Gandhi was now um, Mahatma Gandhi was now the starting of civil disobedience movement but that was not started at all now here the important action the most important action of that year you could say was of the Poon Savaraj the term Poon Savaraj or the full independence for our country now the Lahore session Lahore Congress session of 26 December 1929 it was declared by Jawaharlal Nehru as a Poon Savaraj that we want to have we have to gain the Poon Savaraj or the full independence for our country and just after one 
one year in 1980 it was 1929 and in 1930 there would be independence in our country on the same date and people would just uh, not sing their pledge for our country for the struggles of independence but people didn't have any kind of interest in that moment interest in that kind of struggle for independence that was the poor Saraj term because people had already lost hope in the non-cooperation movement and that's why there was a little bit less support there wasn't that much support at well and because Muslim communities had also parted apart from uh, Mahatma Gandhi and that's why there was less support of people and that's when Mahatma Gandhi thought of another thing that is uniting all the people by raising an issue by rising in the issue that would be so popular among the people and that was of the salt now he thought of salt issue so what was about the salt issue salt march that is, let's discuss about it with our subtopic that is the salt march and the civil disobedience movement so the salt march and the civil disobedience movement as i've said the issue of salt that was raised and that was arisen by mahatma gandhi so according to the salt rule of britishers by britishers it was that a lot of tax was imposed on salt and mahatma gandhi saw it as a sign of raising issue now he thought that salt that was consumed by rich and poor in the same quantity and this should not be any kind of tax on the salt at all it was a basic condemnation for every person in India and that's when he started salt march so basically the more you if you look at the background story of this salt march that it would be on the 31st January of 1930 first of all Mahatma Gandhi sent a letter to Viceroy Irwin says feeding many demands of the people now first one the 11 demands that was by him that were the general demands and after that there were demands of people that were from from the industrialists to the workers peasants you could say and after that one of the issues in one of the demands that were into that were all was of the salt now Mahatma Gandhi had already said that all those demands if they were fully completed were fully demanded were fully declared to the people by the 11th of March then there would then it is okay but if it isn't if those demands aren't fulfilled by the 11th of March then it would be that there will be civil disobedience movement that would be started by Mahatma Gandhi but you know that Britishers that was just stubborn now Lord Irwin refused to negotiate with Mahatma Gandhi and that's when on 11th of March on in 1930 there was a salt march now from the Sabarmati ashram in Gujarat Mahatma Gandhi with his most trusted disciples or volunteers that were 78 volunteers went to the went on the march towards the uh, towards the Dandi towards the Dandi region of Gujarat now on 11th of March he took off and after 24 days Days. after 24 days with 240 miles that travel that journey was of 240 miles and per day he traveled 10 miles and in the regions where he stopped people would thousands of people would gather in that area and would start to hear from him so you could say that that was his journey and finally on 6 April of 1930 he reached the, uh, reached the bay reached the beach of Dandi region and, and there he made he made the salt out of the water out of the ocean water and after that the salt law was broken by Mahatma Gandhi and that was the starting point of civil disobedience movement now in civil disobedience movements what was the difference between civil disobedience movement and the non-cooperation movement now civil disobedience movement here main most important thing that was declared by Mahatma Gandhi was done that we would not just boycott the foreign items but we will also break their rules in a non violative manner like for example in the reserved forest many pastures grazers were now going and were now grazing grass and many items from the reserved item reserved forest were also being taken by the tribal communities so all those rules that were imposed that were very harsh and were imposed on the Indian citizens were now breaking by the people by those people by themselves and that was the civil disobedience movement and that was started in 1930 so you could say that, that is about a civil disobedience movement but after that what happened that many local leaders because Britishers also saw it as a uprising and that's why they were now oppressing it surpassing it and in 1931 even Mahatma Gandhi 
was arrested. Earlier than that, Jawaharlal Nehru and Ghaffar Abdul Khan, who was the most trusted disciple of Mahatma Gandhi. So when he was arrested in 1931, many people just broke into the streets and were just attacking the public for offices, buildings. And in 1931, after that, Mahatma Gandhi himself was arrested by the Britishers. And that's when people were just outraged, they were just burst out of anger. You could say there's so much anger towards the British officers and that's why in many regions of the north, mostly the northern India, there were so much, you know, that Protestants that came up and just burned down the public official buildings and, uh, you know, that British buildings, public meetings and all those things. So you could say that in 1931, the situation was just so, so, so bad because of that, because of the arrestment of those people, of those leaders of Congress and of Mahatma Gandhi, absolutely. And after that, you could say that because of that much violation, because of that much use of violence, and that's why Mahatma Gandhi just took off, just called off this movement that was civil disobedience movement, and came with a pact with Lord Viceroy, with Lord Iron, that was the Viceroy of country, of our country during that time. And that pact was that that there would be round table conference among them. But the round first round table, but the first round table conference was just not was just not attended by the Congress leaders. So according to that, you could say that on the 1st of March of 1931, he came, Mahatma Gandhi came with a pact with Lord Irwin and after that, this civil disobedience movement was just called up. Now here we have to see that whenever he started his movement and just called off, now there were more and more, you know, that people were less losing their hopes because those people who had left their everything on the support of because he were, they were supporting Mahatma Gandhi for the, for the independence of their, of their country. Now they were losing their homes because they didn't have anything left. So you could say that after the starting of civil disobedience movement, there was a little bit, a little bit hopes among the people. But after that, when he called off, there was he was losing support a little bit. So that is about 1931, the civil disobedience movement. That is when the people became disobedient. But after that, when the you know that's um <laughs> And you know what that Mahatma Gandhi had to go to the London for a meeting and when he came back he just saw that the situation had turned upside upside down what happened was that the and Nehru Khan Abdul Khan were still in the prison and there was so much harsh imposed there were many harsh rules and acts that were imposed on the people of India even more and more on their demonstrations on their meetings on their plays and songs and all those things and that's why he again started the civil disobedience movement but just for one but just for one year and it lost its momentum because in 1934 it had to be called down because it didn't have any kind of momentum as I've already said that when he's just starting and calling off people would just lose his support and that's why in 1934 he had to call off the civil disobedience movement and that is about our civil disobedience movement earlier it was non-cooperation movement that has to be turned down because of violation and after that it lost its momentum the civil disobedience movement but here one fact is that that uh, when this movement was started civil disobedience movement many people were abandoned many people had well started participated in this movement now many in manufacturer companies so much salt was produced by the Indians so you could say that that had did have a very good impact on the people of India but after that when it was called off it did lose its all support all hope he could say so that is about the salt march that is also known as the dandy march and the civil disobedience movement now our next subtopic is how participants saw the movements so how participants saw the movement now here movements mean the civil disobedience movement so how all those participants just as i've said that there were so many participants in the civil disobedience movement that when it was started before calling off so how different type of people how different participants saw the, this movement let's discuss about it now first of all let's discuss about the rich peasants rich agricultural farmers or landlords now you could say that in Uttar Pradesh there were Jats and in Gujarat there were Patidars. Now those were the rich peasants.
citizens who had a lot of land and a lot of money as well. Now their main focus when there was agriculture, you know, that very there was a very bad harvest, and even that little harvest was not sold to the market when the prices were falling down and they had a very lot of loss, a very great loss, and that's why they could not pay the revenue to the government, to the Britishers, you could say, to the British government, and that's why they but they participated in the civil disobedience movement so that they wouldn't they would be a little bit decrease in the revenue so that they would be able to pay it and that's why they participated in the civil disobedience movement for the revenues to be decreased down but when it was called off in 1931 there was ultimately no decrease in the revenues and that's why when it was again started when it was restarted in 1932 obviously no there was no peasant rich for peasants there were less number of peasants who participated in a civil disobedience movement when it was restarted because they had already lost their hope and they had already lost their so much money in that and that's why they were not again they refused to again participate in the civil disobedience movement in 1932 and it was just a very obvious human nature because they had already participated in the civil disobedience movement when it was started. Now there wasn't anything that was done for them. So why would they participate in that again? That would be their own loss. That would be just you know that digging their own grave. And that's why they didn't participate in the civil disobedience movement when it was restarted by Mahatma Gandhi in 1932. And after that, if you look at the peasants who were not rich, who were uh, you know that low peasants, poor peasants or those who had rented the land from those landlords, from those rich peasants. Now first of all, if their demands were taken too much from the Congress party, then obviously in the first phase of non of civil disobedience movement, there would, there wouldn't be any kind of support from the rich peasants. And the main problem for these poor peasants was that their rents. Now you know what, that they had rented the lands from the landlords and that's why they were not able to pay the rent and they wanted that that unpaid rent should be remitted from them but that concept of no rent wasn't accepted by the congress party because if they had accepted it then there's the support of those rich peasants would be taken off and that's why they had to maintain the balance and that's why those demands are kind of the relation between the poor peasants and the congress party was a kind of uncertain so you could see that in both phases their relations are were kind of uncertain and after that if we talk about the industrialist or the businessman now industrialists are the businessmen now in the first world war they had a keen so much profit they had gained so much profit from the from their business you could say that because in the first world war there was a need of more and more equipment to the Britishers and that's why they were gaining more and more profit but after that when the there was an the end of first world war now there were many restrictions that were imposed on them about the imports and exports of the goods and that's why they part Participated in a civil disobedience movement in the phase one that is when it was started actually in 1930 now they wanted that there should be no any uh, no not any kind of restrictions on them that much so they wanted a less restriction on them and that's why many organizations were formed by those businessmen as well as you know that they were so rich and powerful and that's why when their support was to those movements to those civil disobedience movement and that's why it was becoming a very big success now, uh, during that time, in 1937, FICCI was created. That was Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Now, it was formed in 1927 and was led by prominent businessmen or industrialists during that time. That were Purushottam, Purushottam Thakur Das or Jir Das. So, there were some, uh, you know, that's very big business now, businessmen during that time who led those prominent business, who led those prominent organizations about the Indian industries and businesses so those were things going on with those businessmen or industrialists but after that when the civil disobedience movement was called off they just refused to restart it again so that it was restarted they didn't pay any attention to it because they didn't have any gain in it now when they supported the first civil you know that civil disobedience movement when it was started actually now they thought that if they support it again then there would be so much loss of them because they had to spend so much money and they were also not 
doing so much business that day uh, during that time and they thought that there would be problem if they support it again to pay the revenues or taxes to British government and that's why again there was no support from those people and the workers now the last two years we are going to discuss about the workers workers that were working in those companies industries and business offices now the first year thing that they, they weren't do that much workers who were supporting the civil disobedience movement as their landlords as their industrialist capitalist were there now they were seeing that when they were all when their own industrialists and businessmen were there then they had to stay apart because those workers had their demands against those industrialists and businessmen and that's why they couldn't keep it together and that's why they weren't that much participants who were workers in the civil disobedience movement but there were still many workers who were adopting the ideas of Mahatma Gandhi ji that was about the you know that boycotting all those foreign items so that was done by the workers but was not they hadn't participated in the civil disobedience movement so that is about the workers you could say now we have seen about those class of men but what about women now here women also played a very important role now in the march saw the most important work of was of women now there were many women who helped in the making of salt and also in the civil disobedience movement in the both phases but what did they get you know that the vision of the people wasn't that much now in standing congress or uh, congress leaders were also seeing them just as a mere women there and Mahatma Gandhi was also convinced that it was the duty of women to do the domestic course to be good wives and take care of the children so that was the mindset of the people during that time and it was only after a great struggle of women when there was some rights that were given to them so that is how the participants saw the movement what were their views now their views differ from each other and it's just obvious because just think about that there are some other people rich people would have their own problems and low people or poor people would have their own problems now there was just another thing that was a limitation of that movement and what was that let's discuss about it with our next subtopic that is the limit of civil disobedience so the li limit of civil disobedience now this one said that there were limitations on civil disobedience movement and what were those limitations let's discuss about that now during that time one of the worst situation of our country worst mindset of the people practice of the people was of the untouchability the tradition the practice of untouchability that has been abolished by the article 17 of our fundamental rights but during that time there wasn't that right about the abolition of untouchability and that's why there was a very uh, you could say that there was a very worse practice of untouchability in our country and you could say that those untouchables were considered and the untouchables and after that they considered themselves as Dalits now they were supported by Mahatma Gandhi but wasn't supported by the society and that's why they didn't participate in a civil disobedience movement and furthermore they had participated they had done their own movements they had uh, formed established their own organizations and the main leader of those untouchables or, or those or the list was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Now Dr. B. R. Ambedkar has already studied about them. We have already studied about them that he was also a leader of Dalits and he was a very great man. He was the main architect of the constitution of India and just a great man for our country. You could say that, that he was the architect, chief architect of our constitution and did many works for, the, for our country and was also the first law minister of our country so that he was a leader of Dalits he also belonged to the same uh, you know that Dalit caste the from Mahar caste so that was his caste and he had himself suffered a lot of discrimination and that's why he was raising voice against those who are doing the untouchability practice now in grand reality what was happening that those untouchable people or those Dalits weren't allowed in those public places in temples and public towns they didn't have any access to public tanks wells roads societies that were made for those upper high caste people so those low class people are scheduled caste that are known uh, earlier they were known as the depressed classes now by, by the, your doctor B.R. Ambedkar they were known as the depressed classes and now what was happening was now that Dr. B.R. Ambedkar was now demanding for the reservement 
for those scheduled castes, for those Dalits in the educational institutions and their separate electorates. And when it was heard by Mahatma Gandhi, then he just did a fast to the death. Now he was saying that it would lead to the communalism in our country. When they even in the same even in the same religion, if they were in the same religion, there are these much separations. And what about the country? What about the religions? And that's why he wasn't agreeing with that. And that's why in 1932, finally their conclusion was the Pune Pact. Now, now in Pune Pact, it was decided that in legislative and provincial there would be reservations for the Dalit classes or the depressed classes. But overall, they will be united and there wouldn't be that much separation among them. So that was done in the Pune Pact of 1932. But earlier, still they didn't participate in the uh, in the civil disobedience movement. They still formed their own organizations and did their movement themselves by themselves. And it was just during that time writing that was done to, that was to be done in that situation because in the society those kind of people weren't accepted by the society upper high class people and that mindset of people was a worse and that had to be broken and for doing so Mahatma Gandhi also did many things now first of all he also cleaned the toilet and did the works of sweepers to show that that we have that every person has his own dignity and we must respect them and that's why he was urging those upper class people that we should respect them as all at all but you know what that they, there was a very lot of struggle for doing so so you could say that that is about those movement that was a limitation for civil disobedience movement because even if they wanted to come they wouldn't be allowed there even if Mahatma Gandhi wanted but what about those people who were supporting from the upper high class people so that was about and this was said about women too. Now, in women, there were many those who participated in the rural areas. They were from the high peasants, and in upper, in urban areas, they were from high classes people. But still, they weren't accepted. But at least they were given chance to um, participate in the movement. But weren't given to those untouchables or those Dalit people. That was about the, uh, you know, that. Um, about the caste system in our country but about the religion system as i said that as i've explained that about the hindu and muslim the khilafat agitation the khilafat issue but after that muslim saw that when the non-cooperation movement was over now muslim had apartheid from hindu uh, you could say that in this from this congress or from the leadership of mahatma gandhi and now you could say that congress party was giving support and was having support so much from the hindu organizations like hindu mahasabha and those type of Hindu organization that led in kind of agitation to the Muslim parties. Now Muslim League that was a Muslim representation all over the country during that time that was led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Now he was asking for his own electorate in the elections and you could say that they were now uh, talking to each other. Now Mahatma Gandhi and the Muslim League, the Congress party and the Muslim League were now talking to each other and, and, and only one condition the Muslim League was accepted. Now Muslim League agreed only at one condition that they would not demand any kind of reserve reservations in the elections only if they were given in the general and in the provincial elections the reservations a kind of electorates their own electorates but that wasn't accepted by congress and that's why there was a kind of uncertain relationship between those two parties and after that even in the civil disobedience movement there was a very great disunity among the hindus and muslims now over days what would happen that in some areas in if today it is in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, then it, uh, another day it will be Gujarat, and another day Punjab, and in any region, there were just fights among Hindus and Muslims in the universities, in colleges, and a lot of discrimination as well. Now, in Muslim populated areas, there would be discrimination against Hindus, and in the Hindus populated areas, there would be discrimination against Muslims. So, so that was just so useful in our country during that time, a very bad mindset of the people, too. So, you have to see that there were limitations of the civil disobedience movement as well whenever you know that just as i said that the introduction of the test chapter that when we wanted to confer when we wanted to unite or unite all the groups of our country but there were many conflicts that emerged and these are those commerce those are these are those conflicts you could say that were against the unity of our country and the proverb that in strength lies in unity wasn't seen in our country at all now our next topic is the sense of collective belonging so the sense of collective belonging now we have seen the ideas of nationalism how the ideas of national 
of them were going through in India, but actually there were anti-colonialism. But what about the people's mind? You know what? That there is nationalism, but there must be a sense of unity as well. Now, what were those ideas through which there was a sense of belonging, collective belonging? Now, that, now you know what? That through different things, different cultural ideas like history and fiction about folklore, new songs, symbols, ideas, icons, they were all spread in India. Now you know what? That many people were drawing, many people were interpreting the history of India to show that what we had got, to show a kind of sense of unity, sense of belonging, collective belonging in our country. Now first of all, the image of the country matters the most. As we have seen in the last chapter, the Germania, the Mariani of Germany and France, that were the nation's face. But what about India's? There was, that was known, that is known as Bharat Mata. Now Bharat Mata, that was first printed by Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay. Chandra Chattopadhyay. Now in Sadeshi movement, that was led so much. That was, uh, you know, that that was uh, promoted too much. And Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay also wrote the national song of our country, that is the Vande Matram. So it was written by him and you could say that that was written by him and was also promoted in the Salishi movement of Bengal and after that inspired by him you could say Abhinandranath Tagore from Bengal region he also drew the image of Bharat Mata and that was in that picture she was uh, you know that a lady figure was there wearing the traditional costume of her country that is a sari and is shown as a calm as thick and very uh, you could say that intelligent woman and after that though there were many copies of that version of picture that is the Bharat Mata, the national image of our country and you could see that many new symbols and icons were shown in that picture to show what he had got in the nationalism ideas and to show the unity among the people. <laughs> And also, if we talk about the Sadeshi movement, there were many things that were promoted in that movement. And after that, as I've said, that many new songs, folklore tales. Now, many folklore tales, the folk tales, traditional tales of our country were also brought up. Now, like for example, in Madras, in the region of Madras, there was Natesha of Sastri who wrote the folklore of Tamil Nadu, who wrote the, who wrote the folklore of southern India with a very, so many volumes, around 33 volumes. So you could say that that is about the folk tales of our country to bring the unity among the people in the northern India, southern India, religious and caste system as well. So that is about the unity, the sense of collective belonging. As I said, it about the folklore and songs. Now many songs were also written, like for example, Rabindranath Tagore. You have already written, uh, already studied about him. He wrote the national anthem of our country, that is a Jan Gan Man. So you could say that that was written by him, and I also spread. He also the image of Bharat Mata and you know that many nice songs that were written by him he was also a very great poet so that was him and you could see that he also promoted the Shanti Niketan so you could see that sense of unity that was spread that was being spread by different people and the most important the history of interpretation the interpretation of history now the most important thing that what Britishers said to us was that that they thought that Indians were primitive and fragile but we had to show the history that in history we had got a lot of achievements in the fields of art and architecture, math, science and in all fields and it was only uh, the promotion or you know that the achievements when Britishers conquered us, when Britishers were trying to repress us or surpass us. So that was being done in the period of colonialism that was shown in the interpretation of the history. You have to see that the sense of collective belonging but still in everything there was was a problem they had to be a block in the way and that was done whenever the history was shown if it was the Hindus then all the other communities felt out so you could say that there, that was the biggest problem there because Hindu was a majority and even today it is a majority in our country so it's obvious that minorities in our country will obviously feel left out so that is a matter belonging of the same community the unity in our country the sense of community <laughs> And now there were many people who tried to unite each other by different songs, by different anthems, and by different poems, pictures, pictures, items, folklore tales, and the and plays as well in our country, in the streets, in the markets, in the grand reality among the people. Because those who are illiterate could also understand. Because during that time there was so much illiteracy rate in our country. So you could say that that is about the sense of collective belonging. Now next and last subtopic of this chapter is. 
Conclusion. So the conclusion of this chapter. Now, first of all, before the conclusion, let's discuss about something about the Quit India Movement that is given in the specific books box in our book. Now, Quit India Movement that was started at the, around the time period of First World War in 1942. When there was first, sec, uh, not First World War, that was Second World War. When the Second World War was started, now Mahatma Gandhi saw an opportunity to get rid of all the Britishers. And during that time, the term that was used in the uh, Congress session, it was about the Quit India. Now they wanted the complete that they wanted to get rid of the British completely and that's why quit India movement was started in the 1942 and many students many young leaders like Jay Prakash Narayan, Asaf Ali Khan and many women leaders as well from Madhya Pradesh and, and from Assam regions came into this movement and finally in 1947 we got our independence so it was because of the second world war as all of you know that second world war that ended in 1945 around the time period of 1945 to 1946 and it was about the that we had already discussed in the last class history. So about that, related, related to that, we have to relate it to our country as well. During that time, there was a movement that was quit in a movement that was started by Mahatma Gandhi and it got successful as well, we could say, because it took a, a more than a year to surpass that movement. Now, the conclusion of this chapter, what, do you, what do, you, do you have as a conclusion of this chapter? Now, in this chapter, we saw that the conclusion could be that there, was, there were many struggles for the unity of our country. Congress tried to unite all people in our country and many struggles, movements that were started to unite the country for the feeling of nationalism that raised but still there were many conflicts even in, into the regions, religions and even in the same religion that is in Hindu, the caste system. So between Hindu Muslims and even in the Hindus there were uh, Dalits and upper class people, the lower class people and the upper class people. So you could say the conclusion of this chapter could be that there were many trials to bring us together to bring us unity but all failed and that's why you could say that there was unity in our country this unity in our country that was seen during that time and that could be the conclusion of this chapter now centralized unity the most important proverb in this chapter that should be added now i could say that during that time the most important thing that that was needed in our country was the unity because there wasn't any unity there were people fighting over each other then how could we get independence from britishers so we had a lot of struggle for the independence in our country Country. and that is the conclusion of this chapter now in this tablet we have seen from standing to last we have seen the dates and there are some important dates that you must remember now this chapter must be gone and must have been easy for you because you have already studied about it but a little bit more perspective we have seen about those people who were the participants in these movements but still it is a kind of same to that of class 8 history so there must there shouldn't be any kind of problem to learn these chapters content and you just have to remember some important things in this chapter so this is all i have discussed in this chapter i have discussed our topics and subtopics and the remaining chapters of this book will be covered in the further upcoming videos so thank you very much